they flung a German sutra. Universal with this conduct and vows. Chapter Forty. Sutra translated on imperial command by the Tang Dynasty Chibitaka Dharma Master Prama of Gupta. Commentary. In listening to the explanation of the sutra, one should become familiar with the sutra. In this sutra of the great vehicle of all the small vehicle, I will use a matter of public regard to point out the differences between the two. In India, there were two brothers who were Bodhisattvas, Asanga and Asubandhu. Asubandhu Bodhisattva, because of some unfortunate causes and conditions, had followed the small vehicle teachings while his older brother Asanga Bodhisattva studied the great vehicle. Although Vasubandhu was especially intelligent, Asanga nevertheless wished to convert him to understanding and believing the drama of the great vehicle. But he did not have the power to cause his brother to believe. Vasubandhu was intent on his praise of the small vehicle and said that the great vehicle drama was incorrect. Filled with dismay at his brother's refusal to even consider the great vehicle sutras, Sangha Bodhisattva were then devised an expedient method. He felt a severe illness and asked his brother to come to look at him and see him for the last time. He wrote, I am very old and I will soon die. If you don't come to see me now, we will never see one another again. His brother came at once to see him. Asanga said, "I will certainly die. Would you read the Great Vihaya Sutra to me? Then I can die with my eyes closed. That is to die, having taken care of his of all his affairs in the world." Although his younger brother did not feel that his brother's illness was very serious. Nevertheless, he decided to humor him and began reading the Great Vihaya Sutra to him. Which sutra did he read? He read this Flower Adornment Sutra, and the more he read, the more inconceivable it became. Then he knew that the the Flower Adornment experience was wonderful and inexplicable, just like the sun in space illumining all things. Or like a great interest net wherein the infinity of jewels emit light, and each jewel reflects the light from all the other jewels. Then he realized his previous mistakes and, engulfed with uncontrollable remorse, said, "Quickly, give me a sword." His older brother asked, "Why do you want a sword?" "Because I want to cut out my tongue." He said, "Why do you want to cut out your tongue?" Asaga asked, "Because in the past," he said, "I used it to praise the drama of the small vehicle and slander the sutras of the great vehicle. This is an offense. So now that I realize this, I should cut out my tongue." When his older brother heard this, he said, "That is not necessary. Why is that?" Asked Vasubandhu, "My offenses are too great. Now I wish to cut out my tongue." His brother said, "If you were standing on the ground and you fell down, would you not stand up again? You would not continue to lie on the ground, would you? You would put your hands on the ground and push yourself up. Previously, you slandered the slander, the great vehicle, and praised the small vehicle with your tongue. Now you can use your tongue." To praise the great Vihago, Vasubandhu thought that this was reasonable and refrained from cutting out his tongue. And from that day on, he put his strength into cultivating in accord with what is right, studying the sutras of the great Vihago, including the Flower Adornment Sutra. Later, he wrote the Shastra of the Ten Grounds, and upon completing his work, the earth was quite. And his mouth emitted light. When this happened, the king came to visit him and asked, "Have you been certified to the fruition of a hardship?" Vasubandhu Bodhisattva said, 
No, the king said. If you have not been certified to the fruition of a hardship, then how is it that the earth has quaked and light comes from come forth from your mouth? Vasubandhu Bodhisattva said. When I was young, I studied the small vehicle and slandered the great vehicle. Now I have changed and studied the flower adornment sutra. I have written the sutra on the ten grounds, and after I finished it, the earth quaked, and my mouth emitted light. It is not that I have been certified. Then the king decided that the flower adornment sutra was very subtle and wonderful, and he began to study it. Here is another matter of public record. The translator of the eighty-row edition of the Flower Adornment Sutra was named Shikshananda, whose name very appropriately means delight in study. After he translated the Flower Adornment Sutra into Chinese, he delivered lectures on it. And when he came to the sentence "Seeds of Buddha lands as numerous as the most in world systems." The crowd quaked in the lecture hall in which he was speaking. His work on this sutra took place during the Tang Dynasty, during the time of Emperor Wu Tezian, also known as Tian Ho. One night, she dreamed that the heavens sent down sweet dew, and the next day, following her dream, it rained, and it rained sweet dew. That was another sign that the translation of the Flower Adornment Sutra. Was very important. After he completed his translation of the Flower Dharma Sutra, Sri Shankaranda lectured it. And when he was lecturing, the great earthquake. At that time, the impressor Wu Suqian wrote a letter to praise Sri Shankaranda's work. Therefore, the inconceivable states of the Flower Dharma Sutra are extremely many, and it is difficult to explain them in a few words. Translated on imperial command, imperial command means the emperor ordered the translation of his sutra from the Indian language into Chinese during the Tang Dynasty. Tripitaka. There are three pitakas or stores in the Buddhist canon: the sutra store, the Vinaya store, and the Shastra store. In the sutras, the Buddha taught the path of cultivation. The Vinaya contains all the moral precepts, while the Shastras include all the exegesis. This is the meaning of Chipitaka or three stores. Dharma master. Some explain Dharma master as one who takes、uh, the Dharma as his master. That is, one's master is the Buddha Dharma. Some explain it as one who gives the Dharma to others. These are the meanings of Dharma Master. Who was this Tripitaka Dharma Master? He was called Prana. Prana is a Sanskrit word which is translated as wisdom. Why is it transliterated instead of translated? Because it is one of the five untranslated terms. It was not translated because it has many meanings which cannot be translated in one word. The other four kinds of untranslated terms are esoteric terms, terms which refer to something not existing in the translator's country, terms that traditionally have not been translated, and terms of respect. Kuba, known today as Kashmir, was the name of country during the Tang Dynasty where Master Prana was born. Sutra. The chapter on entering the inconceivable state of liberation on the conduct and vows of universal worthy. Commentary: Entering means to reach to the inconceivable state of liberation, which cannot be thought of. Basically, liberation has no state. If there was a state, it could not be liberation. Why does it say state of liberation? The word state is used to express emptiness. Because basically, when one is liberated, there is nothing at all. Conduct and vows. Conduct is the great practice which the Bodhisattva Universal Worthy cultivates, and vows are the vows that he makes. His cultivation and vows surpass all others, and so he is called Universal Worthy Bodhisattva of great conduct and vows. Universal Worthy. 
What is a universal? It means his way pervades everywhere. What does worthy mean? It means his virtue is a sage's virtue. His conduct is identical to the conduct of foremost sages. Therefore, great bodhisattvas. Manjushri Bodhisattva is foremost in wisdom. The Bodhisattva who observes the sounds of the world, Avalokiteshvara, is foremost in great compassion. Earth Star, Shri Gaba, is foremost in the strength of vows. Universal Worthy, Samanta Padra, is foremost in practice. In the sea of the flower star world, in the flower adornment sutra, Universal worthy Bodhisattva acts as the Dharma host. Dharma is spoken on request, so to hear the Dharma, a disciple must ask the Buddha to speak. Shariputra was the one who requested the Dharma in the wonderful Dharma Lotus Flower Sutra, and Ananda requested the Dharma of the Suragama Sutra. It was Universal worthy Bodhisattva who, on behalf of the assembly, requested the Dharma of the Flower Adornment Sutra. His con this concludes the explanation of the title of this chapter. Sutra, uh, that um, universal worthy Bodhisattva Mahasattva, having praised the thus come one's merit and virtue. Commentary, uh, that time, um, refers to the time following the explanation of the previous chapter. Universal worthy. Is the Bodhisattva whose way pervades everywhere and who possesses virtue of the sages? What is Bodhisattva? Those who have studied sutras already understand this term, but there are those who, for whom this material is new and who do not understand the word Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is a Sanskrit word. Bodhi means enlightenment, and sattva means sentience. That is a Bodhisattva. Is person who enlightens sentient beings. What does sentient beings mean? Sentient beings include living creatures who have feeling and perception. And perception. Today, someone asked me if flowers are not sentient, or how can they be? How can they make sounds? It's a good question. So now I will explain it clearly. Trees and plants have no feeling, although they are without feeling. They do have a nature, the nature of life. What is the nature of life? It is the life energy, Jan, discussed in Confucianism. The life energy is a nature, and this nature can be said to be the way. It can also be called the mother of the ten thousand things. Do humans have a life energy? Of course they do. If they were without it, then they would not be called humans. If they were not called humans, then what would they be called? You can call them anything you wish. For a human to have a life energy means to be human, or to speak it more correctly, to be of the way. The phrase "life energy" was coined by Confucius, and all plants and trees possess it. How can you say that plants and trees have a life energy? In the spring, their limbs, branches, and leaves grow. Flowers blossom and fruits come forth. This is because they have the nature of life. Not only do they have the nature of life, all plants, flowers, and trees have a minute amount of knowledge. So someone asked me, when you cut a flower, it emits a sound which we cannot hear. But if you use scientific means, then it can be heard. This is really common. Why is it that plants and trees can make sounds? It is because they have a nature. This nature is not full, but only exists in a minute amount. For example, if a person was said to have one hundred powers of nature, the flowers, plants, and trees, by comparison, would not have even an ounce, but would have about as much as a hair. Now, this is a comparison. So do not take it literally. Basically, plants, flowers, and trees do experience some kind of sensation. I have said this before. In China, a camphor and ginkgo tree received the precepts. You ask, how is it that they could take the precepts since they are not sentient? How is it that they can have the nature of humans and receive the precepts? This is true contradictory. 
This is not the least bit contradictory because if you understood it, you would see it is very ordinary because the trees were old and they had experienced much and because they had lived among people in the world, gradually they acquired the nature of humans. They had life energy. After they had life energy, then they acquired a little feeling. Because of this feeling, they wished to take the precepts. For a long time, they did not realize how many improper things they had done. But after a while, they recognized their mistakes, took the precepts, and even thought, thought about living the home life. We should be aware of this point. Not only does he cross over sentient beings, but he also crosses over those without feelings. So it is said, both those with and without feelings can accomplish the way. All of them can accomplish the Buddha's way. It is for the reason that he is called universal worthy. Not only does he want to save people, but he also wants to cross over all flowers, plants, and trees. How can we not admire the vastness of his practices at their best? The most people are only aware of crossing over other people, crossing over other sentient beings. But universal worthy Bodhisattva even crosses over those without life, and so he is called universal worthy Bodhisattva. The word Bodhisattva can also be translated as a living being with a great mind for the way. Although still among living beings, his mind of the great, of the way is great because he is open to all, with no thoughts of jealousy, selfishness, self-benefit, or obstruction. The Bodhisattva is also called one who is open. Following the word Bodhisattva, the text says Mahasattva. A Mahasattva is a great Bodhisattva. Universal worthy Bodhisattva is a great Bodhisattva among Bodhisattvas. If he is great, then who is a small bodhisattva? When you first bring forth the mind to cultivate the bodhisattva path, you are a small bodhisattva. After you have brought forth the mind of a bodhisattva for a long, long time, then you become a great bodhisattva. Upon first receiving the bodhisattva precepts, you become a small bodhisattva. After you have held and practiced according to these precepts for a long time, then you are considered a great bodhisattva. When you have done this for hundreds of years, then you can be considered an old bodhisattva. Universal worthy bodhisattva praised and paid homage to the first comers, married and virtual. What does praise mean? It means to lord. To lord whom? It means to lord the Buddha, the world honored one. Pay homage means to worship, to pay homage to the supremacy of the first come one's merit and virtue. What is first come one? It is one of the ten names of the Buddha. A long time ago, all Buddhas were known by many names, but it was difficult for people to remember them all, so the number was reduced to ten thousand names. It became difficult for people to remember all ten thousand names. So they were further reduced to one thousand names for each Buddha. But even this was still too many to remember. So the number of names was reduced to one hundred, because the memory of living beings today is very poor. Now we learn only ten names of the for the Buddha, of which first come one is one. First means unmoving or still. Come means movement. This means that in stillness there is movement, and in movement there is stillness. First, come one includes the suchness of the way, which is stillness, and comes to accomplish the right enlightenment, which is movement. Also within this name, there is movement and stillness. There is no movement or stillness in the Buddha's original substance. It does not move, and it is not still. Movement and stillness are not different. Movement is stillness, and stillness is movement. How can I say this? Movement is born from stillness, and stillness manifests out of movement. And therefore, stillness and movement are not two. This is the meaning of first come one. 
In the previous chapter, Universal Worthy Bodhisattva praised the first commons of supreme merit and virtue, a merit and virtue which is superior to all other kinds and to which none other can compare. It is so great that you could never finish describing it. Although no discussion can ever totally describe it, nonetheless, Universal Worthy praises the first commons, especially supreme merit and virtue with his vast and great practice and vows. What is merit and virtue? Merit is what is established, and virtue is something that one does. I will give you an example. In schools, teachers exhaust their hearts and strength to teach, and besides earning their salary, they do much work which is not expected of them. Diligently doing more than what is expected of you is merit. Virtue is good one does for others. It means to help others without seeking any uh, recompense. For example, if I were to give someone fifty thousand dollars without any conditions, without any thought or hope of getting anything in return, this would be a virtuous act. If you wished for something in return, your actions. Are without virtue. You should be kind to others and not seek anything in return. Doing good for everyone and not hoping for a reward or self-benefit. This is what is mean. What is meant by virtue? Although there is great virtue and small virtue, it should not be the case that you only do greatly virtuous deeds and neglect small acts of goodness. Small virtue comes about when you benefit people just a little. But if you do this often, then your virtuous conduct will become great. If you do not do small virtuous virtuous acts, you will never accumulate virtue. So it is said, the way must be practiced. You must cultivate the way in order for it to be the way. Don't talk from morning till night about cultivating the way by never really doing it. This amounts to nothing. But intellectual talk, then, it is useless. Merit is also something that someone does. If you do not do it, you will not have it. So it is said, the way must be practiced. If you do not practice it, what use is the way? Virtuous deeds are to be done. If you do not do them, how is there any virtue? Therefore, the merit and virtue of the first commandment can never be adequately praised. Sutra told all the bodhisattvas and good wealth. Commentary: Universal worthy bodhisattva spoke to all the immeasurable and boundless numbers of bodhisattvas in the Flower Adorned Sutra Assembly. Since all might mean many or few, in this case, does it represent many or few bodhisattvas? Here, it means many. The infinite number of bodhisattva in the Flower Adorned Sutra, in the Flower Adornment Drama Assembly, in addition to Bodhisattvas, Universal Worthy spoke to the youth good wealth. Although he is a child, yet the youth good wealth, whose Sanskrit name is Sudana, is most inconceivable. The youth Sudana had fifty-three teachers, a matter which has caused. Complications in Chinese Buddhism. Disciples of the Buddha in China, wishing to practice along with the youth Sudana, would say, "The youth Sudana had fifty-three teachers, but I have only ten or twenty. That is not too many." This is one of the most diluted and improper practices of Chinese Buddhists, one which I have always opposed vehemently. I am certainly not afraid that my disciples will take other drama masters as their teachers, but nevertheless, I oppose this kind of custom because it is very detrimental. Someone may ask, "Why do you feel that Chinese Buddhists who have ten or twenty teachers are very bad? Why do you consider the conduct of the youth good wealth, who had fifty-three teachers, acceptable?" Everything must be based on true principle. The youth good wealth's first teacher told him to go on to his second teacher, and his second teacher told him to go on to his third teacher. That is the only reason he went to another teacher. He was told to do so.
It is not the case that he heard about a particular person who was adept in conjuration, and so he stole away from his first teacher without advising him of his intention to study with this new person. This is called bowing to a new teacher while turning your back on your old master. If you want to treat your teacher well, why do you bow to a new teacher? For example, everyone has a father. One second father could be Shakyamuni Buddha, but there is no need to look for a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth father. Your teacher is your mother and father of your transcendental Dharma body. What is the use of having so many teachers? After the youth, Sudana has studied all of the virtual knowledge and wonderful functions of the spiritual penetrations of his first teacher. This teacher told him to go south and take a particular person for his teacher, and so on he went to his next, next teacher. After he had learned all the skill of a teacher, then that teacher would tell Sudana to go south and take as your master a particular worthy sage, Bodhisattva or Bhishu, because his conduct in the way is superior to mine. So in each case, his previous teacher sent him off to a new teacher. He did not steal off to bow to another teacher. Each teacher instructed him to go on to the next until he came to the fifty-third one, because he had studied the spiritual penetrations of fifty-three teachers. He had the wonderful function of spiritual powers, which are extremely great. You should not look upon him as being just a common child. Because he is very capable, nevertheless, because he had so many teachers, Chinese Buddhists now go everywhere bowing to different teachers. This has come to be known as recklessly bowing to teachers. You bow to one teacher and then you bow to another teacher, sneaking from one to another to bow to different teachers. Someone like this is quite. A, Detrimental to Buddhism. When I was in China and Hong Kong, if people had already taken refuge with the Triple Jewel, I would not accept them as a disciple. Why? Because I consider them to be the weak links in Buddhism, the worst kind of Buddhism, a、uh, Buddhist. They were not told by their former teacher to take me as their master. They snuck off to study with me. This is called turning your back on your good teacher. Taking refuge can only be done once. You cannot take refuge again and again. You can take the precepts more than once. The three precepts, the four precepts, the five precepts, the eight precepts, or the ten major or forty-eight minor bodhisattva precepts. Precepts can be all be taken more than once, but you cannot take one teacher in the east, one in the south, one in the west, and one in the north. When you finally die, whose disciple will you be? There will be no place to go. Basically, taking refuge many times is equivalent to not having taken refuge at all. You have had so many teachers, you end up having none. In Buddhism, we want to be true, but in China, there are still elder Buddhists who run around taking refuge many times, perhaps even a few hundred times in one life. But if you ask them what it means to take refuge, their eyes become blank, and they do not know, do not know what to say. They do not know what it means. They have taken refuge hundreds of times, and they do not know what it means to take refuge. It is, it is not beautiful. They say all those who have left the home life are my teachers. They have taken refuge with everyone who has left the home life, and yet I believe that. They do not even have one teacher. Why? Because they do not truly believe. They must believe to be rescued. If they do not believe, then they cannot be rescued. In China, the bishops quarrelled over disciples. For example, the disciples of one drama master would secretly run off to another drama master, unaware they were doing wrong. This indicates that a drama master has no virtue, because if he had virtue, why would his disciples leave for another teacher? Because of this, the two drama masters involved would get into argument. 
you have snatched my disciples. They would fight over the drama like this, and as soon as they began arguing, their bad aspects would become apparent. The fire and ignorance would flare up. For example, in China, Dharma Master Tai Su and Dharma Master Yuan Ying would fight over disciples just like the clashing of water and fire. They were often unkind to one another, all because their disciples ran away to take refuge. They were afraid of losing their disciples to one another. They went to extremes to prevent this. Even though the youth good wealth has a very important position in the Flower Adorno Sutra, he has nevertheless caused complications within Buddhism. Why do Dharma masters accept disciples of other masters as their own disciples when they know that it is incorrect and not in accord with the Dharma? With the Dharma? Now I will reveal their innermost intentions. It is because they wish to take advantage of the conditions. If they have more disciples, then they can get more red envelopes, which they appreciate more than anything. Because in China, these red envelopes always contain donations of money. If so, if they do not accept disciples, they will be losing money. As soon as they accept a disciple, the disciple thinks. This is my teacher, and I should do my best to make offerings to him. So these dharma masters get money, which causes their hearts to move. Even though they clearly know they are incorrect, they still do this. Now, is this is this not a complication? Why did this happen? First, it is because of the youth, and second, it is because of good wealth. Since he was wealthy, he moved everyone. Everyone, everyone is fond of wealth. The youth was just a child, and this child was very wealthy. Almost all people feel that money is very flashy and nice to have, and so some cultivators are moved to such extremes that they do things they know are incorrect. This is one of the worst aspects of Buddhism, one which I hope will not arise in America. Do not take refuge with one teacher and then take refuge with another. If you find a good teacher after you take refuge with him, do not rebel against him. Against him, rebel means to renounce your religion and turn your back on the teacher.